don't put too much stress on your first kiss. It'll happen. But like, it gets it gets better or funnier. And like, <laughs> yeah, and it only gets it only gets magical if you're actually in love with the person. You know, like later yeah. on after you've yeah. kissed them a lot. But yeah, yeah. usually the first That's kiss. That's for women. But I want a guy to force himself on me. I am open to trans women doing the same, but I don't see too many of them wanting. Oh, some of them do do like work off the side because like some sure. of them are actually sex workers. So like, yeah. there's never a shortage for someone to take take a nice forty year old hairy man uh, aside and you know. Take him. <laughs> just, just really right. take him. <laughs> uh, like, this awesome. is one last kiss, but she won't let me have it. I want to get over her, but I can't. I need help. Hey, this is Morgan Rector. Join me and my co-host, Rosanna Chilton, for the Confession Post podcast. Confessionpost.com is a website where users post highly personal content anonymously for the reading pleasure of other users. On this podcast, Rosanna and I read confessions from the site and give our analysis. You can listen to the Confession Post podcast on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and wherever else you get your podcasts. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am Rachel Telfor. And I'm Michelle Gower. We are the hosts of a new true crime podcast. It is called Children of the Void. The Void refers to children who are missing. And children who have died under mysterious and suspicious circumstances. Sometimes parents know nothing about what has happened to their child. And sometimes they seem to know more than they let on. Like Casey Anthony. And the John JonBenet Ramsey case. We are determined to do our part to find missing children and the truth when the story of their disappearance doesn't hold up together we will blast the shadows with light so that no more children disappear into the void children of the void debuts in september join us so we can all make a difference please subscribe until then i'm rachel telfor and i'm michelle gower You can catch Children of the Void on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and everywhere else you get your podcasts. Hey, y'all. Morgan Rector here. Do you have an idea for a podcast? Furthermore, would you like to host and co-produce your own podcast? I am always looking to expand the portfolio of my company, Leader One Podcast Network. If you would like to have your own show, send me an email and we can talk about it. Aside from politics and religion, I'm open to just about any topic. If you are passionate, knowledgeable, and articulate, I want to talk to you. You can contact me by email, morgansvariety at gmail.com. I hope to hear from you soon. Hey, Morgan Rector here. I'm just dropping a line to say thank you to all of my Patreon donors. Since I'm not a Joe Rogan or Mark Marin, podcasting is more or less a starving artist gig for guys like me. Patreon donations keep me from having to take a job that would take away from my ability to generate more Human Monsters content. The website URL for Patreon is www.patreon, that's spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N, dot com slash leader, O-N-E, leader one. A way to make a one-time donation is to send it through PayPal at morganrector.com. 331, Rector spelled R E C T O R, at hotmail.com. Morgan Rector 331 at hotmail.com. You don't have to give a large amount of money if it isn't possible. If a dollar a month or a dollar one time is the best you can pony up, it would be gratefully accepted.
I know how hard things are for everybody during COVID. Thank you for all the support you have given the show, whether it is through financial donations or simply by listening. I am grateful for all you have given to me and the program. Enjoy the show. Welcome to Human Monsters. How do you sum up a human monster like Earl Nelson? He was dubbed the Dark Strangler, Gorilla Man, and the Gorilla Killer. How did he earn those dubious honorifics? He had nothing against gorillas. Human females were his target. Any investigating police officer knew that he was a serial killer, rapist, and necrophile. This is his story. Childhood Earl Nelson was born on May 12, 1897, in San Francisco, to Francis Nelson and James Farrell. His mother had syphilis, which she contracted from his philandering father. When Earl was born, Her vagina was surrounded by warts and the customary leakage. Today, syphilis is treated with antibiotics, and the prognosis is generally optimistic if it is treated early enough. Carriers of the infection in 1897 were not quite so fortunate, and this put Earl at risk for contracting the disease. The hospital staff certainly thought so, and they tried to discourage Francis from breastfeeding, though they were not successful. His parents had a troubled marriage. His father was an alcoholic who spent most of his take-home pay on liquor and whores. There was little left for his mother to make meals and cover other household expenses. This laid a bedrock foundation for a continual pattern of dysfunction. Eventually, without warning, his father fled the nest entirely. It wasn't just an oncoming case of a distaste for family life. He succumbed to his own case of syphilis. The infection took his life as he lay in a gutter down by the docks. Frances soon followed. She fed the baby when she could, but the money was hard to come by. Mostly she received charity. She was months behind in rent. The bacteria of the disease was eating away at her face. It had almost completely eaten away her nose. Her palms were covered in pustules. Their secretions leaked into the baby's swaddling whenever she lifted him from his cot. Francis did not take to motherhood, especially when Earl fussed and cried. At the age of six months, his mother began to ignore his distress. At one point, it went on for so long that the landlord became concerned that something had happened to the child. When he knocked on the door, there was no response, so he broke it down. He discovered the corpse of Francis lying on the floor, spread-eagled. The baby was still screaming. Earl was taken into the care of his maternal grandmother, Jenny Nelson, who eventually adopted him. It could be argued that the parenting and household culture of Jenny Nelson was the polar opposite of that of Francis. Jenny's life revolved around her involvement in the Pentecostal religion. She ruled with an iron fist and it clung tightly to the crucifix. Indulgence and entertainment were forbidden if it was in violation of her religious beliefs. Nobody read secular documents in that house. 
They could only read the Bible and other Christian material. If the children had surplus energy to burn, it could only be used to do household chores. No sports, no nature exploration, no play of any kind. This standard drove Frances to flee her home and pursue the life that led to her demise. Jenny was determined that Earl would not slip through the cracks as Frances had. She also disapproved of his father's Spanish ancestry, rechristening him Earl Nelson. He rarely heard about his birth mother, and when he did, his grandmother mostly referenced her when warning him about the consequences of sinning. Earl didn't fit into this household. He always had trouble walking, and took to walking on all fours, like an ape, or, more specifically, a gorilla. Then there were his table manners. After the rest of the family said grace, or patiently sat through it, he would dive into his food like an animal. He would dump olive oil all over the food to make it slick, and then attack it with his face on his plate scarfing it down in chunks like a dog. He would be caned for it, but he would do it again at the next meal, grunting and squealing like a pig. He accepted the corporal punishment and kept on doing it, tit for tat. Eventually, the rest of the family became accustomed to his quirks. He would do strange things, like walk around the house on his hands and lift furniture with his teeth. His aunts and uncles welcomed it as entertainment, which was sorely needed in their mother's puritanical home. He didn't fit in at school. He struggled with academics. He annoyed the faculty and student body by preaching the word of the Lord with a fire and brimstone style. He would make pronouncements of self-loathing. He would leave his home in clean and iron clothes, and come back in tattered rags. He was beaten for that. Other children found his behavior during play off-putting. Roughhousing led to biting and aggressive wrestling moves. He would remove birds from nests. He played chicken with oncoming trains, leaping aside at the last moment. He mocked friends who were too afraid to do the same. He believed his faith had put him on the right track. That was one aspect of his grandmother's influence that stuck with him. He pushed his luck too far one day. He was riding his bicycle down the street when one of the wheels got stuck in the streetcar tracks. It slowed him down, so much so that when the streetcar came around the bend, it hit him in the head. It knocked him to the ground, leaving a hole in his head. He began to shake and spasm. He spoke in the chaotic syntax of word salad, as if speaking in tongues, which is a common practice among Pentecostals. This time it was a neurological issue. His friends brought him to his grandmother's house. He got no sympathy from her. She was frustrated that he brought this upon himself. She was also irked that he wet his pants. She cleaned him up and put him in bed, where he remained for the subsequent six days. The bicycle accident inflicted irreversible brain damage on Earl. It impaired his memory to such a degree that he couldn't even recall owning a bicycle. That wasn't even the worst of the effects of the injury. He had headaches, fainting spells, and wet his bed frequently. In a desperate attempt to self-medicate, he would break into his grandmother's liquor cabinet. That only made him nauseous. As an atheist would see it, he was now blessed to be free of the fear and revulsion his corporeal urges induced in him before the accident. He masturbated like a man possessed, day and night. Jenny tried to catch him in the act so she could shame him for it. But he was wise to her endeavor, and he devised ways to do it covertly, free of her detection. Jenny was convinced that when his head was hit by the streetcar, Jesus was shaken free from his soul, his absence furnishing a vacancy for the devil. 
He began creeping around the house at night, taking his autoerotic activity to the next level. Jenny was used to this nocturnal activity. In the past, it consisted of pilfering food or reading the Book of Revelations into the early morning hours. This was different. He would stand outside his Aunt Lillian's room, playing with himself. He did this as Lillian prepared for sleep, topless and brushing her hair. Jenny wasn't completely sure of what he was doing since he didn't take his dick out. She would shift her body in bed and his acute hearing, one sense that wasn't affected by the accident, would detect her movement and he would drop to his hands and feet and shuffle back to his bedroom. Jenny would shut Lillian's door if she got wise to this as it was in progress. Jenny considered throwing him out of the house. She still felt some lingering sympathy for him, however. He didn't have a father in his life to instill firm guidance and discipline, so she allowed that these behaviors were likely not entirely his fault. She was also reluctant to release him out into the world at that stage for fear that he would turn out like his mother. He was very much a work in progress, and he needed someone to mold him into a respectable citizen. He got better at hiding his voyeurism and masturbation. The brain injury left Earl with a hypersensitivity to bright light. He became a night crawler. He enjoyed spending time in the basement. He liked the darkness, the cool temperatures, and the wide open space. He felt free down there. Nobody judged him in the basement. He heard voices and answered them and sermonized to them and himself. Jenny was distressed by this dialogue with unseen presences. But since he was proselytizing to them, she found it within herself to be tolerant. Also, he appeared to have abandoned his sexual self-gratification. She could accept his bizarre behavior as long as it was oriented toward Christ. Nevertheless, she was still paranoid about his voyeurism. She locked the door of the bathroom and her bedroom whenever she was nude. This move backfired one day when she slipped in the tub. She called out for assistance, but nobody was around to come to her aid. She passed out. While she was unconscious, the hours of lying nude in cold water left her with pneumonia. She was laid up in bed for a month until she succumbed to her illness and died. Earl lost a parent for the third time in his life. Earl was 14 years old and entirely unprepared to live on his own. It wasn't just because of his youth. He was developmentally delayed naturally, and the condition had worsened since his accident. Hell, he could barely dress himself without assistance. How could he have applied for a job? Would he really have walked into the personnel office on all fours? None of his other relatives wanted to take him on. They knew how odd he was. He did nothing to hide his dysfunctional behavior and eccentricities. They would have been too embarrassed to take on this boy who talked to himself and had frequent fainting spells. The only relative who still had a soft spot for him was his Aunt Lillian. She was able to zero in on the truth of Earl Nelson and focus on his more endearing characteristics. Like his love of entertaining her with his unique form of slapstick physical comedy. Her husband wasn't quite so taken with him, but they didn't interact much since he worked during the day and Earl lived a nocturnal existence, often disappearing into the outside world after hours. He didn't give them any trouble, and Lillian allowed him as much freedom as he wanted to explore the outside world. She didn't even ask him where he was going or where he had been. Sometimes he would roam the countryside in search of adventure. He would sleep in hunting shelters and abandoned or infrequently used cabins. He also loved to walk the streets of San Francisco. The police did not harass him 
They considered him respectable for dressing in a suit and reciting scripture. Others left him unmolested for the same reasons, although others were put off by his tendency to talk to himself, and they kept their distance for that reason alone. Like his father, he drank heavily, though his use of alcohol was to alleviate physical pain. He slept in alleyways. He haunted some of his father's old stomping grounds. He befriended prostitutes, though he never utilized their services. His presence discouraged anyone who wished to visit harm upon them, so they had a friend in Earl Nelson. Well, he could only hold out for so long. He decided to lose his virginity, and it was with an aging prostitute. Call girls are generally tough and calloused emotionally, but the woman who escorted Earl Nelson into manhood was unprepared for what he inflicted upon her. He didn't beat her up, which was always a concern when a prostitute entered a private space with a john. What happened was, after he ejaculated, he wouldn't stop thrusting into her. He kept pounding away at her, his eyes having rolled up into his head. He kept uttering, Hallelujah. He could not self-shame his way out of this. After all, all his life he was told that he was both a sinner and an imbecile. Ostensibly, he was told that he was both depraved and worthless. All he was doing was embracing the image that had been foisted upon him. He still hated himself, but no escape hatch would emerge in the foreseeable future from this persona he had leaned into. This was Earl Nelson. Lillian gave him an allowance, and unbeknownst to her, he spent it all on drinking and horrors. He was his father through and through. The only missing link in that chain was syphilis, but it was out there waiting for him if he continued along that trajectory. He lacked the discriminating tastes his father acquired from years of debauchery. He drank the cheapest rot-gut whiskey he could find. The whores were ugly, old, and ailing. It was a buffet of sloppy seconds, and he gorged himself. He no longer ventured to the rural areas to sleep in abandoned hunting lodges. He was now at home at the cat houses and docklands. Having fallen from grace, he landed at the bottom where he was right at home with the lowlifes. If Jenny had been around to witness it, she would have had a fainting spell of her own. Prostitutes would stop him at naked when they observed open sores on his genitals. They were oozing with pus. The ladies of the evening weren't about to welcome this occupational hazard with open legs. Earl Nelson and his package were blackballed from the area's bordellos. To make matters worse, the shame his grandmother inculcated into him regarding sex and its myriad contracted maladies instilled within him a reluctance to seek treatment. Put off by the city, Earl decided to hit the road. He would vacate Lillian's house for weeks at a time. Lillian didn't object. Life was easier without dealing with the burden of caring for this young man who could barely take care of himself. In Earl's life as a transient, the 1920s stereotype of the train-hopping hobo held up. Doing this, he could leave behind the pain associated with home. He lacked the courage to take his travels to the national stage so he explored California from north to south, and everywhere in between. He often relied upon abandoned and unoccupied hunting lodges for shelters. This didn't always work out to his advantage. On one occasion, he entered the premises of a cabin that was occupied by a family spending the weekend there for a couple of days of R&R. The father of the clan woke to the sound of an unwashed hobo, walking around like he owned the joint. Earl found himself staring down the barrel of a gun until the police arrived to take him away. During his trial, he talked to himself 
which would be interpreted as being symptomatic of a mental illness in 2021. In 1921, a judge would be more likely to perceive this behavior as a show of disrespect directed at both him and the court. That's exactly how this judge inferred Earl's random ramblings in 1915. For unlawful entry, Earl Nelson was sentenced to two years to be served at San Quentin State Penitentiary. He was 18 years old and ushered into adulthood straight through the doors of one of America's most notorious prisons. Life in San Quentin can be rough, but Earl Nelson served his time without incident. He was used to being unable to care for himself, so the provisions of meals, shelter, and medical care were welcomed. He was even treated for the syphilis. A silver lining that cut straight through VD and left him liberated within the prison walls to masturbate compulsively. This was vintage Earl Nelson. Correctional institution as a nomenclature was truly apt when it came to this offender. Earl's devotion to faith and scripture won him respect from many of the prison's inmates, even among its most perverted and violent convicts. It was 1915, after all. The others interpreted the manifestations of his mental illness as indicative of potential danger, so they gave him a wide berth. Nelson was released after a year due to good behavior and overcrowding. The way the parole board saw it, his worst fault was that he was a little overzealous when it came to his religious faith, but they hardly saw that as a shortcoming. For all this, he became a free man on September 6, 1916. Lillian did not welcome Earl back in her home. She could tolerate his mental illness, but she would not allow a criminal to share her home with all the potential repercussions to her and her husband's reputations. He gathered up the rest of his clothing and fled, not just from her house, but from the greater San Francisco area. During his travels throughout California, he would not stay in unoccupied forest cabins, but he would steal every item of worth he could find in them and sell them. He never slept in these abodes. He didn't want to risk getting caught again. He would sleep on the trains as they ferried him to another place to burglarize. Nevertheless, he still awoke some of the inhabitants of these houses, and before long, he attracted the attention of the authorities, especially when he broke into the homes of the area's wealthier residents. He was caught breaking into a townhouse in San Joaquin County by the police before the occupants became aware of what he was doing. He was sentenced to six months for petty larceny because of the goods he possessed at the time, which were stolen from another house. He served his time in a city jail and was released in mid-1917. Nelson was intent on resuming his favorite old pastime of whoring. This was out of the question. He was still banned from all the cat houses of San Francisco, so he commuted to Los Angeles. The problem was, after legal costs and bail, he had no money for whores. A day after his arrival in Los Angeles, he was arrested for burglary. Because he was a repeat offender, he was bound to serve several years. The voices in his head told him to commit suicide to avoid the long years of incarceration. He informed the staff of Los Angeles County Jail that if they did not set him free, he would cut his wrists. The corrections officers laughed it off. Even if he had been serious, it just would have meant one less convict to deal with. Instead of escaping prison in a body bag, he dug his way out. The jail was so crowded, the staff and inmates didn't even notice he was gone. World War I had begun, and, caught up in the patriotic fervor in the air, Earl Nelson made a beeline to the closest military base and enlisted. Nelson's zeal yielded mixed results. 
Though he excelled at the physical exercises, he lacked discipline in other areas, like getting up early in the morning. He showered for long periods at night. He talked to himself, which also did little to endear him to his fellow recruits. He was the most hated man on the base. The administration dealt with it by assigning him cleaning and guard duties. Needless to say, when he deserted the base, no effort was expended to track him down. Nelson wound up in Salt Lake City, Utah. It's a very religious city, with its status as the Mecca of the Mormon religion. Not only would his whoring and criminal activities be frowned upon, but Mormons don't drink alcohol, which was another aspect of life in this city that would make things uncomfortable for him. He had to leave. He enlisted in the Navy. The Navy was based in San Francisco. They had overtaken the area once known as the Docklands. The shady hive of moral decrepitude was displaced by the regimented facilities of the Navy. He was a poor fit for the Navy as well. It required a standard of self-discipline to which he was incapable of adhering. He fell back into what remained of San Francisco's low life. After two months, he re-enlisted, this time under a pseudonym. He was to work as a medical corpsman. He defected months later, but this time military police intervened in time. They asked him why he would abandon his country in its hour of need. He claimed that he was afflicted by a, quote, burning about the anus, unquote, as he put it. Buggery was an open secret within the U.S. military so they weren't shocked to hear about it. They assumed he contracted a venereal disease. To avoid the kind of embarrassment this would bring upon the base, they released him from custody, though he was not discharged from the service. Nelson's mental health became a concern for the administration. He talked to himself day and night, reciting verses from the Book of Revelations, he believed that World War I was the manifestation of the end times, as foreseen by the Bible. Nelson was remanded to the Napa State Mental Hospital. It was there where he finally opened up about his troubles. Medical tests revealed his previous infections with VD. His heavy consumption of alcohol was also detected. His disuse of alcohol was not informed by moral considerations. It simply did not provide him with relief from the physical aches and pains he suffered. The headaches were still so painful he fainted from them. His brain injury was determined to be the cause of many of his physical and psychological disorders. He roamed the hallways at night and even managed to escape but he didn't get far. He was eventually tracked down in downtown San Francisco and returned to his cell. Ultimately, the hospital decided he was harmless, and he was discharged by both the hospital and the Navy. He ran into Lillian on the street. He followed her home. She was remorseful about the fate that befell Nelson after she put him out on the street. She felt she let her mother down. He settled in the basement. He didn't interact much with the other inhabitants of the house. The one exception was Lillian, who would go down at night, brush his hair to the side with her hand, and tell him he was loved. This went on for several months. Her husband leaned on her to pressure Earl to find a job. He was hired by St. Mary's Hospital to work as a custodian. He registered under the pseudonym Evan Lewis Fuller. His recitation of Bible verses was actually welcome among patients and staff. It did much to reduce tension among patients who were coping with their afflictions. One fringe benefit of working in the hospital was the discovery of Mary Martin, a 58-year-old spinster. 
he would stop by her administrative workspace and stare at her. While this would likely have made most women uncomfortable, Mary was flattered, even if she was old enough to be his mother. They talked over coffee on their breaks on a regular basis. A mutual attraction developed, but Mary wasn't willing to have sex before marriage. He accepted her celibacy and continued to court her. He eventually proposed marriage and was quite persistent when he met with her refusals. She would discourage him by listing the disadvantages that their May-December romance entailed, but he was so in love with her that he could not be dissuaded. He even offered her an engagement ring. Her one last condition was that they would have to be wedded in a Catholic ceremony. He had no objections. He wasn't loyal to any particular sect. He finally won her over. They married in August 1919. They consummated their union on their wedding night. He treated her like she was one of the whores he used to hire. He utilized her like she was an instrument. She had been a virgin all her life, so she had nothing to compare it to. For all she knew, it could have been commonplace. She wasn't aware that lovemaking wasn't supposed to leave her so sore. When she declined to have sex with him, he would masturbate beside her. When she confronted him about his onanism, he said, You wouldn't do what a wife is meant to. This remark was jarring, to be sure, but he was so loving and affectionate at other times that she was willing to overlook his evaluation of her sexual proclivities. He wasn't abusive in any other way, so she let it go. When he did get angry, he would take out his rage on their possessions. On more than one occasion, he punched a hole in the wall because he saw her talking to a male stranger. At his worst, he would break wooden furniture into kindling. He became convinced that she was giving it away all over town. The same woman who wouldn't sleep with him until after they were married. The same woman who didn't lose her virginity until she was menopausal. One day he returned home from work to find a man sitting at their kitchen table. He walked to the kitchen to retrieve a large knife. He was introduced to the man before any blood could be shed. He met his brother-in-law. The men were cordial throughout the evening, but after her brother left, Earl burst forth with rage. He was jealous of her brother. The insinuation that there was an incestuous attraction between Mary and her own sibling was repugnant to her. Earl had concocted a detailed sexual play-by-play -play in his imagination and listed all the particulars. Despite his lack of evidence, he continued to accuse Mary of infidelity. It became a habit, then an obsession. With his thorn implanted deeply in her side, he now twisted it with his negligent hygiene. When he did wash himself, he would take a bizarre approach to the practice, like pouring water over his toes at the kitchen table. Other strange behaviors emerged. He would change his clothing constantly, alternating between suits and costumes. When he wasn't making suits out of Mary's dresses, he might wear a plaid golfer's outfit or a sailor's uniform. Mary had made a serious mistake in marrying this man, but she maintained her anti-divorce stance in keeping with her steadfast adherence to the Catholic ethos. She would try to justify his bizarre behavior by citing his brain injury as a cause. Speaking of which, the headaches and dizziness had gotten worse. It didn't help that one day, while repainting a section of the hospital's roof, he became dizzy and fell to the ground, landing head first. This was the second life-changing brain injury. He left the hospital abruptly, the bandages still on his head. When he came home, he was not the man Mary knew as her husband. His obsession with the content of the Book of Revelations had become the locus of his thoughts. He spoke tirelessly of how the so-called Great Beast of Revelations would appear on earth 
to herald the end of the world. There was no evidence to substantiate his claims that the end of the world was nigh, but it was axiomatic that his marriage was disintegrating. He identified by his birth name, disclosed his military background, and told her about his nights in prison. Hearing the voices of angels that urged him to slit his wrists so that the world may drown in his blood. This earl person was a shell of the man she married. One night he returned just after midnight after having disappeared for hours. There was a distinctive odor about him, as always, only this time it was the smell of liquor and good time pussy. His suit was filthy. He looked like he had been rolling around on the ground. He was so out to lunch by this point, she decided to forego any inquiry into his whereabouts. He would disappear while she was asleep, and this came as a great relief to her. It meant he wouldn't approach her for sex, and that was just fine by her. Eventually, he disappeared altogether, and she filed for divorce. May 19th, 1921. Once again, Earl Nelson prowled the streets of San Francisco. He sought shelter somewhere behind the corners and alleyways of urban sprawl. One day, dressed in the boiler suit he wore while working at the hospital, he went up to 1519 Pacific Avenue and told the young man who answered that he was a plumber who was dispatched to inspect the boiler in the basement. It was the middle of the day, and the man didn't come across as shady, so the boy thought nothing of it. He let the man in. One of the townhouse's occupants, 12-year-old Mary, heard someone muttering in the basement. She went down the stairs, unaware that a man claiming to be a plumber had been admitted by her brother. Like a monster of myth and legend, he reached out of the shadows, and his hands gobbled her up dragging her by the ankles downward as she was swallowed up by darkness. He yanked at her clothing, aggressively pulling it off. He manhandled her about the bosom and groin. She screamed. He put his hand over her mouth, but still she continued to scream. Her brother Charles came running down to the basement, intervening on his sister's behalf just in time. Charles kicked Earl, and it was enough to send him rolling off her. He got up after regaining his senses. Charles ordered Mary to alert the police. Earl tried to escape, but Charles punched him in the stomach. Charles punched and kicked Earl in a frenzy. Mary ran to the street and called for help. The neighbors assumed it was just a childish game and ignored her. Earl fought Charles tooth and nail, and eventually made his way out the front door. Charles joined Mary in calling for the police. Earl tried to flee, but Charles grabbed his sleeve. Earl punched Charles so hard he knocked him out cold. Charles fell to the ground. With the neighbors now recognizing how serious the situation really was, several of them came to the children's aid. Earl turned and ran. Words spread throughout the city about what he had done. The police and concerned parents were on the lookout. Earl was brought to justice and faced a judge the next morning. He was a mess. Charles Summers left several scratch marks on his face. His boiler suit was so badly torn that a sleeve had been severed. He had been screaming at faces he saw in a wall for lying to him. He plucked every hair of his eyebrows with his fingernails. The judge decided that, based on Earl's mental illness, he was not fit to stand trial. He was remanded to a city hospital to be evaluated and treated by mental health professionals. Mary, still his wife at this time, visited him in the hospital. He didn't recognize her and he bore little resemblance to the man she married. He was bound in a straitjacket. He was confined to the bed with thick leather straps. 
he reeked of body odor. He was thrashing about, ranting and raving, lost in the delusions of psychosis. Mary cried when she saw him in that state. Given his condition, her divorce was processed without opposition. She still felt enough compassion for him to persuade the court to treat him as a patient rather than a criminal. Her campaign was successful. Once again, he was sent to Napa State Hospital. This time he was deemed a threat to himself and others. He was diagnosed with a psychotic disorder. Later, staff added nomadic dementia to the list of symptoms. This time they would ensure he would never leave. When he had his limited jaunts in the outdoors, he walked through the institution's garden, bound and shackled. He received treatment for syphilis, which alleviated his psychotic symptoms somewhat. He became easier to deal with for a time, but eventually he refused treatment and began to openly contemplate an escape. November 2nd, 1923. Somehow Earl Nelson escaped from Napa State Hospital. He went to Lillian's house, but she put him out, aware she was of his latest criminal behavior. She didn't feel it would be safe for her children to be around him. They fled at the sight of him. After Lillian pushed him back out to the street, she notified Napa State Hospital and the police of Earl's whereabouts. They tracked him down, and he was brought back to the hospital. He spent 16 months in the hospital before he was discharged on May 19, 1925. February 20th, 1926. Clara Newman was the landlady of a boarding house. On this day, she was interrupted while cooking her lunch by a knock on the front door. It was likely a response to the Room for Rent sign posted in the window. She opened the door to a man who introduced himself as Roger Wilson. He asked her if the room was still available. She advised him of her strict policy prohibiting the presence of liquor and female visitors. Before the expected confirmation... He lunged forward and wrapped his hands around her throat. Having clutched her tightly in his hands, he collapsed forward onto the floor, bringing her down with him. She tried to scream, but he squeezed her throat with so much force it did not permit passage of the requisite amount of breath. Mary Summers served as a perfect example of how this sort of thing could go horribly wrong if the victim were permitted to scream. He was just as keen on an unconscious victim, even more so, since they were always so pliant. Clara fainted. Earl picked her up by her neck. He carried her up the stairs to the vacant room. Once he was situated, he pushed Clara's skirts up high enough that he was able to mount her. He penetrated her, grunting like an animal. Having ejaculated inside of Clara Newman's corpse, he tidied himself up and fled down the stairs before he was stopped by an unfamiliar voice that said, Can I help you, sir? Without looking back at the man, Earl said, Please tell the landlady that I shall take the room. I will return in an hour. The man was Merton Newman, nephew of Clara. To his horror, he discovered Clara's dead body long after Earl left. Earl Nelson justified the act to himself with the rationalization that if God had not wanted her to die, she would not have been so trusting as to let him in. He further decided that if God wanted him to stop short of her execution, the police would have caught him. Somehow. From there he concluded that God wanted him to kill. His lusts came from God, and so did his homicidal urges. The Lord works in mysterious ways, and that would help explain how he could, he could give himself permission to violate the Sixth Commandment. March 2nd. Earl migrated to San Jose, 
There he stumbled upon a house advertising a vacancy. He approached the house and discussed living arrangements with 63-year-old Laura Beal. By this point, he had polished his deceptive spiel. He was prepared for her screening questions. He also knew how to better prevent getting caught. He asked Laura to show him the room before his attack. He placed his hand over her mouth before choking her, negating any possibility of her screaming for intervention. He drove her down to the floor. He tore at her clothing. She didn't go down without a fight, and the next few minutes were spent wrestling and struggling. He removed the belt of her house coat and tied it around her neck. He pulled with all his considerable strength. She bucked against his formidable bulk. She choked on the limited amount of breath she managed to squeeze from the atmosphere. He continued to pull, and now the silk belt began to cut into her flesh. Drops of blood trickled down her neck, the secretions of which syncopated with the rapid pulse of her elevated heartbeat, pounding as it was, until it didn't. She was dead. Her corpse, a lifeless reproduction of her former life as a mortal, Nelson went to work on it to satisfy his necrophiliac desire. Now that she was dead, she was incapable of judgment, and in Nelson's warped and morbid logic, this nullified the act as a sin. Seeing that indignity to a body was impossible due to its inability to feel dignity, he pulled off her undergarments. He took a moment to savor the sight of her aged flesh. He sniffed the air for the gaseous manifestation of her essence, however undetectable it may have been to the average bystander. He mauled her sexual organs. She was unable to shame him for doing so like his grandmother would have. He penetrated her remains, utilizing her death as a means to achieve an orgasm, known in French as Le Petit Mort, or The Little Death. It took a while for her husband to find her body. When it was examined by the police, they discovered that not only had another incident of necrophilia occurred, but it may be connected to a previous incident. Late March, 1928, Earl Nelson picked up a newspaper and scanned the classified section for room rentals. Earl Nelson wound up on the doorstep of 63-year-old widow Lillian St. Mary. She was visually impaired and frail. She was eager to rent out the rooms. There was a high rate of turnover due to negligent housekeeping. As she was about to head out one day to collect her pension check, she opened the door to a man with his hand raised, poised to knock. They briefly discussed the business of renting him the room. She was so thrilled she invited him in, free of trepidation. As she ushered him upstairs, she informed him of the house rules and other conditions of the rental agreement. She felt a hand around her throat. It had a powerful grip, like a vice made of iron. He bore down on her until he crushed her on the floor. Unable to prevail upon him with her limited strength, it wasn't long before her lungs were purged of air. She was dead. Finished to the world, but ready for Earl Nelson's post-mortem defilement. He was achingly hard, from seeing her bloodshot eyes bulge out of their sockets. He placed her on the bed of the room he would have rented if he hadn't killed her. He pulled up her skirt and pulled down her underpants. He climbed up between her legs and bore into her like a power drill, whose utility was not to repair but to deconstruct in this hour of sabotage. The incessant humping of the unsatiated that had caused so much discomfort for prostitutes got no complaints from the inanimate Lillian St. Mary. As he plowed into her, he recited scripture as if it somehow 
redeemed him as his actions virtually explicated wrongdoing. He left her house with a smile on his face. Lillian St. Mary's body was found by one of her lodgers. Earl Nelson was so effective at committing a quiet murder that the tenant only learned of her death when he stuck his head in the room to see if there was a new tenant. San Francisco police alerted the public through newspapers that an area man was murdering women who operated boarding houses. These women were cautioned against showing a prospective tenant a room unaccompanied by a third party. They were also warned to be wary of any strange man who might approach them anywhere. The killer didn't strike again for a month. Some outlandish rumors spread throughout town, the most outrageous of which consisted of an escaped gorilla from a traveling zoo. This was the genesis of how Earl Nelson came to be known as the Gorilla Man and Gorilla Killer. Terror turned to mockery, and eventually the city's denizens forgot about the threat he posed to elderly landladies. Will Franey was a railroad worker and a tenant in the boarding house of Mrs. Ollie Russell in Santa Barbara. He went to sleep after an exhausting shift. He was startled awake by a knocking sound a few hours later. This he did not appreciate at all. He put on some clothes and walked to the next room. It had been unoccupied but it occurred to him that it would likely have been taken up by a new lodger. Whoever it was, Will Franey was ready to give them a piece of his mind. The door of the next room was closed. The knocking sound persisted. Franey knelt and looked through the keyhole. There was a woman on the bed. He couldn't get a glimpse of her face, but he could see her bare thigh propped up against the fabric of a man's pant leg. The man was rocking his hips back and forth. The man was having sex with her. The knocking sound came from the headboard banging against the wall. This surprised Franey, since Mrs. Russell did not allow such activity in her house. Franey hadn't even been allowed to entertain a female cousin without Mrs. Russell and her husband acting as chaperones. He had a good mind to report it to Mrs. Russell. He didn't recognize the man, so he assumed one of the female tenants had a gentleman caller into her room. He took another look through the keyhole. He got a better look at the woman. Her clothing was very similar to outfits he had seen on Mrs. Russell. He also recognized the wrinkles and varicose veins on her calves. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. It was totally out of character for Mrs. Ollie Russell to turn floozy and give it away to any silver-tongued devil. After returning to his room and nearly throwing up in his mouth, the thumping stopped. Suddenly he heard the man make tracks down the hall and out the house. He went back to the room and tried the door. It was locked. He looked through the keyhole again. Mrs. Russell was still flat on the bed. Not a trace of movement. He saw a red coloration around her throat. It had spread to the bed covers. He brought the situation to the attention of her husband, who alerted the police. Franey ran to the bathroom and vomited. Unlike the San Francisco victims, Mrs. Russell had also been beaten about the face. Her face was so damaged by the beating, she was unrecognizable. All the blood poured out of the ligature wound on her neck. The gorilla killer had struck again. August 16th, 1926, Oakland. Stephen returned home from work in the middle of a heat wave. When he arrived, looking forward to cooling down, his heart began to race when he entered the kitchen of the boarding house he co-owned with his wife, Mary Nisbet and saw that a meal had been abandoned halfway through preparation. His wife wasn't in their bedroom, 
He waited in the kitchen for her to appear, but she did not. He asked the male tenants if they could help him search for her. Everybody knew about the gorilla killer by then, and he feared the worst. He went to the second floor. He entered an unoccupied room and saw that the bathroom door was open. He was terrified of what he might see. When he took a peek, he saw blood on the tiles and a glimpse of his wife's pale white skin. She had been dumped alongside the toilet. He couldn't bear to see more. He called the police. Smart decision. The police who did take a look at the murder scene emerged from the bathroom in search of another toilet. They were pale and nauseous. Mary had a habit of keeping a dish towel draped over her shoulder. The murderer used it as a ligature and strangled her with it until he tore it apart. The horrors didn't end there. Her head had been slammed into the walls and floor with so much brute force that all her teeth were knocked out. They were scattered across the floor among the streaks of blood. The killer defaced the entire bathroom floor with her blood. When Mary Nisbet's body was stuffed in next to the toilet, it was done with so much aggression that her hip joints and shoulders were dislocated. Her husband Stephen was interrogated for 40 hours but he was ruled out as a suspect after it was verified that he was at work at the time the murder was committed. By the time the interrogation was concluded, Earl Nelson had crossed state lines. He traveled north of California by train. October 19, 1926, Portland, Oregon. Beta Withers went missing from her boarding house. She was the youngest of the guerrilla killer victims at 35 years old. She reminded him of his Aunt Lillian, who was the first woman he desired. He killed and raped Withers in that order. He was shocked by the shame he suddenly felt after committing the act. This time he would hide the evidence. He carried her body up to the attic and put it into a steamer trunk. He covered her with the objects that had been stored inside when he found it. He felt that it was as if his shameful act had disappeared now that he decreased the likelihood that her body would be discovered. October 20th, 1926, Portland, Oregon. Virginia Grant disappeared from a property she owned. He wasn't quite as considerate to the body of Grant as he was with that of Beta Withers. He choked her to death with so much force, he broke her vertebrae. This led law enforcement to assume that she committed suicide by hanging. Nelson raped her corpse. He took her body down to the basement and placed it behind the boiler. October 21st, 1926. Portland, Oregon. Mabel Fluke was missing from her home. Suspicion of her death evolved when a foul stench permeated the house. Her tenants searched the house until one of them found her stuffed into the eaves in the attic. This was the first guerrilla killer victim to have been dismembered. Old associates of Earl Nelson, including his Aunt Lillian and old friends, recognized him from descriptions given by people who had encountered him at the boarding houses but did not know his name. Still, he could not be found. The police launched surveillance operations at train stations. In 1920s America, trains became a way for the country's underclass to unite and escape the disapproval of conventional society. Petty criminals, homosexuals, transient farm laborers, pedophiles, racialized persons, and the mentally ill assembled in boxcars as they were too reluctant to remain in one place for too long for fear of being judged and cast out. They had a common moral code. If they had known the gorilla killer was sitting beside them, taking a swig from the bottle of rot-gut whiskey passing around the circle, they wouldn't have turned him over to the authorities.' 
he had found his tribe. November 18, 1926, San Francisco. William Edmonds returned home from work to discover that his wife Anna had been strangled in their bedroom with a rag and raped post-mortem. It had happened after showing a spare room to a prospective lodger. November 19th, Burlingham, California. One Mrs. H. Murray received a telegram from a man who expressed interest in renting a room in her boarding house. When he arrived, he didn't appear to be shady in any way. Aside from his body odor, there was nothing unpleasant about him from the outset. He was reserved and polite. He even commented extensively on the house's many structural assets. At one point, he asked a question she never fielded from a prospective tenant. He wanted to see the basement so he could have a look at the boiler. She was pregnant at the time and didn't want to risk walking down the stairs for fear that she might slip and fall. She told him her husband might show him the boiler when he got home. The man reoriented her attention to the cornice work around the ceiling of the hallway in which they were standing. When she looked up, she felt fingers wrapping around her throat. They squeezed tightly. She swung and kicked at him. She tried to scream to no avail. She cried, pleading for the life of the baby she was carrying. This stopped him. She was roughly the same age as his mother when she became pregnant with him. He considered what it would be like to leave a little boy to grow up without a mother. He knew what it was like. He didn't want to be responsible for that. He couldn't stop the advance of syphilis that killed his mother, but in this scenario, the power to keep a boy's mother alive resided within the grip of his hand. He had the opportunity to save someone from a lifetime of pain. He did the unfathomable. He let her go. Mrs. Murray scurried back up the stairs, screaming as she did so. By the time she got her bearings and sought the police, her tormentor had disappeared. After giving police a description of the man, News of Mrs. Murray's encounters spread through the community like wildfire. Police searched flop houses to find the culprit or anyone who may have known him in the present or past. News spread to the rest of the nation. Anonymity was no longer assured for Earl Nelson. He fled to Washington State. In Seattle... Florence Monk's strangled cadaver was found behind the furnace in the basement of her Seattle home. In Seattle, Florence Monk's strangled cadaver was found behind the furnace in the basement of her home. It was not just a murder, but also a robbery. He removed a diamond ring from her finger. He stole the rest of her jewelry. He took the money from her purse. Nelson absconded with $10,000 worth of goods from Monk's home. Police were unable to link this incident to the other guerrilla killings because he hadn't stolen material items from the other victims. November 25th, Portland. A man identifying as Adrian Harris reported to the rooming house of Edna Gaylord. He was markedly disheveled, but courteous and charming. He was also introduced to her tenant, Sophie Yates. He paid a week's board in advance and dropped off his case. He had a chat with the women in the reception room. Edna never passed up a chance to tell her tales of woe to anyone who would listen, and Adrian Harris was no exception. She was struggling financially to the point where she couldn't even afford provisions for a Thanksgiving dinner. Without warning, Adrian Harris got up and left. Sophie found this amusing, assuming that he had no patience to listen to Mrs. Gaylord's sob stories. He returned shortly with a roast and trimmings ready for the oven. The trio ate dinner together. Adrian gawked at Sophie, 
the way it was covert enough that she wasn't 100% certain of carnal interest. Blanche Myers was a Portland area landlady. She wasn't concerned about the possibility of being killed by the guerrilla killer. Because of this, she showed one Mr. Williams a vacant room. Mr. Williams was really Earl Nelson, and he strangled her to death with a handkerchief, smiling throughout. He carried her upstairs to her bedroom, where he defiled her corpse. Once he climaxed, he placed her underneath the bed. As he pulled himself up, he left bloody fingerprints on a bed knob. Adrian Harris returned to the Gaylord residence. He announced he was moving out. The women were sorry to see him go. He gave them items of jewelry as early Christmas presents as tokens of gratitude for their company. Edna and Sophie heard that the guerrilla killer had stolen jewelry from one of his victims. They took the gifts they received from Adrian Harris to the police. They confirmed that they had originally belonged to Florence Monk. The police were under massive pressure to bring the guerrilla killer to justice as the community, especially widowed property owners, were gripped by hysteria. December, Council Bluffs, Iowa. Almira Berard returned home after a stint of treatment in a psychiatric ward. She needed to generate income, and her only asset was the surplus of living space in her home. She hadn't kept abreast of what was happening in the world at large, so she knew nothing of the guerrilla killer. One day a man identifying as Mr. Williams showed up on her doorstep. He came across as quiet, polite, and unassuming. He lived there for a time, and he was the ideal tenant, until he tied a silken rope around her neck and barreled down on her until they both collapsed to the floor. She died quickly, leaving behind no signs of foul play. He carried her remains to her bedroom and raped her corpse. There was no dismemberment or any other kind of post-mortem indignity after the necrophilia. He smoothed out her clothing and left. This incident was one for which the Iowan police were unprepared. This sort of thing just did not normally happen in this state. It was more of a California thing. This could be why, taking Berard's history of mental illness into account, they concluded that she had committed suicide. There was evidence that she had been molested post-mortem, and they weren't completely certain that it was a suicide. They were reluctant to confirm or deny that the guerrilla killer had struck in their neck of the woods. This investigation remained unresolved. December 27th, Kansas City, Missouri. Earl Nelson murdered and then raped 23-year-old Bonnie Pace. She was a landlady like all the others. Her body was deposited under her bed. The search for the body always gave him time to escape. December 28th, Germania Harpin joined Bonnie Pace in death at the hands of the same executioner. He strangled her to death with a rage, brought her to her bed, and had sex with her remains. He put her away under her bed when he was finished. Just as Nelson was about to leave, the sound of a baby's cries stopped him in his tracks. He went upstairs to the nursery, where eight-month-old Robert was swaddled in his crib. Earl reached in. He removed the boy's blankets. He removed Robert's cloth diaper, twisted it into a ligature, and tied it around Robert's little neck. Merciful enough to spare Robert the aggression to which he approached his other strangulations, he tightened the garret slowly but firmly. Robert had been screaming and crying. The screams faded into choking sounds. <laughs> 
one last breath. Robert went limp within the confines of the ligature. Earl Nelson had murdered a baby. Nelson justified this act to himself by telling himself he was sparing Robert the pain of growing up without a mother, as he had. The media coverage was heavily censored, with many gruesome details omitted before publication. Many outlets refused to publish the story. It was a testament to how shocked and appalled the common American felt at the depravity to which the guerrilla killer was capable. How low would he go? Paranoia swept across America. Women were afraid to walk alone, even in the safest of the nation's communities. The police were scrambling to find the perpetrator, as the victims' families demanded justice. April 27th, Earl Nelson strangled Mary McConnell to her death. He fulfilled his necrophiliac desires before dumping the body and robbing her home of the most valuable possessions he could find. May. Nelson moved to Buffalo, New York and decided to keep a low profile in hopes that the nationwide manhunt would run out of steam to some extent. He hoped to keep himself financially afloat with the proceeds of the sales of Mary McConnell's belongings. He hit a snag. The pawn shop owner he approached to sell the items operated strictly by the book. If you are an experienced pawnbroker, you know it when somebody brings you stolen merchandise. He refused to purchase the articles from Nelson, though he carefully documented every piece. Earl Nelson took this as a sign from God that it wouldn't be wise to remain in New York State. Jenny Randolph suffered the worst tragedy imaginable. Her son had passed away. Her brother, Gideon Gillette, persuaded her to rent out her son's room so that she wouldn't relive the loss every day by seeing her son's lair without him in it. She put an ad in a local newspaper seeking a tenant. She secretly hoped it would never be answered. A potential rumor showed up at her door. Gideon answered. After a brief conversation that was inaudible to Jenny, Gideon introduced her to one Charles Harrison. He told her he was a painter from New York and interested in renting the room. He was quiet and polite, so he didn't give her the impression that he was troublesome. She was still undecided, though after Mr. Harrison left, she felt some regret. Meanwhile, the pawnbroker filled out a report to submit to the police so that they could compare it to recent files regarding burglaries that had occurred in town. The town's police were not able to connect it to any known home invasions, but they decided it was worth disseminating as a serious concern. They wired the information to major cities, some in other states, and eventually to small townships. Eventually, it was found to be a perfect match for items stolen from the house of Mary McConnell. Stolen jewelry took a back seat to more pressing matters. A grisly murder had been committed in Buffalo. The local police had never encountered such a crime. It was the sort of thing one would expect in a big city. The story was that a local woman was strangled to death and raped post-mortem in her house in the middle of the day. Her brother discovered her corpse under a bed. He made the gruesome discovery when he saw blood leaking onto the carpet. Gideon Gillette felt that he was indirectly responsible for his sister's death. He invited the guerrilla killer into her home after pressuring her to rent out the room. He was wrong to feel guilty, but he also couldn't help but feel that he facilitated the murder. He was tormented with remorse until the moment when he put an army issue service revolver to his head and pulled the trigger. He just could not live with the knowledge that he killed his sister, 
even if the culpability did not rest with him. Earl Nelson avoided the clutches of law enforcement once again. He moved to Detroit. Sixty-year-old Fanny May owned a boarding house with a vacancy. She and longtime resident Maureen Oswald Avery sat with Nelson and interviewed him together. They developed a rigorous screening process for new lodgers, and their instincts would tell them if he posed any kind of threat. After the interview, Maureen showed Nelson the room upstairs. As Fanny waited, the electricity cut out. She cursed in darkness. Instead of going downstairs to look at the fuse box, she went upstairs using daylight as her guide. When she reached the landing, a rhythmic thumping sound emerged. It was coming from the vacant room. When she arrived at the doorway, she saw that the prospective lodger was raping Maureen. The lamp on the bedside table had been knocked on its side. Its electrical cord had been yanked out and used as a ligature around Maureen's throat. It was wound around so tightly it drew blood. Some kind of sound, possibly a gasp, alerted the man to Fanny's presence in the doorway. He stood and walked across the room with his pants down and penis exposed, pointing her way like a threat. She was frozen with fear, unable to run when he grabbed her by the throat. Earl Nelson killed both women, raped both of their corpses, and ransacked the house for valuables. He sold the items at different pawn shops, thinking that selling one piece of merchandise at a time would make the transactions less memorable for the brokers. The bodies of Fannie Mae and Maureen Oswald Avery were only discovered after neighbors observed that the lights in the house were on for several days. They reported the concern to the police, who later discovered the bodies. Earl Nelson arrived in Chicago, Illinois, the day after the carnage in Detroit. He went to the boarding house of Mary Sietzma. He ingratiated his way into her home by conveying to her his love of the Bible. She assumed his commitment to faith was an indication of sound moral character, and she laid the groundwork for a rental agreement. That before he pounced on her and lugged her over to the corner of the vacant bedroom. He grabbed the cord of a lamp and used it as a garret, strangling her to her last breath. He had already smashed her head on the floor a couple of times, which fractured her skull. She was all but catatonic, rendering the operation an easy kill. Nelson had to leave once again, since every murder alerted the authorities to his presence. The problem was, though his real name was not known, the gorilla killer was a household name, and there was nowhere in the country that would not react with pandemonium to another of his offenses. He decided there was no other recourse left than to leave the country. He migrated northward. Earl Nelson got his fresh start in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. He traded his suit at a thrift store for workman's clothes. He wanted to at least appear normal. Catherine Hill had a room for rent, and a prospect by the name of Mr. Woodcotts turned up. Not only did she need the rent to help with living expenses, but she also needed a handyman to do repairs. His room was in the attic. Mr. Woodcotts decided to explore Winnipeg by taking a walk through Mrs. Hill's neighborhood. He followed and eventually approached Lola Cowens. He convinced her to join him in his room. How he enticed her to join him in his private space remains unknown. Once he got her there, he wrapped a length of rope around her neck. He constricted it until he hauled her to death's door. He was too fond of her to kill her so quickly, however. He felt love for her, and he wanted to prolong it as long as he could. 
She was robbed of energy and woozy from being strangled. She was helpless to resist as he stripped them both of clothing. His hands shaking, he traced her contours from top to bottom. She was too numb to register his touch. She did feel tears streaming down her face. She tried scratching him, but he was far from adequate as a defense mechanism. This, Earl Nelson, a.k.a. Mr. Woodcotts, would not abide. He pulled her fingers up to his lips. He crunched down on them. He hooked them under her fingernails and yanked them out. He gouged out all ten fingernails. She tried slapping him, but he grabbed her hand and snapped the wrist joint. When she tried to lock her legs against his attempts to rape her, he snapped her thigh bones as if they were embrittled firewood. He decided to let this one live. There wasn't much left of her, but he could not bring himself to squeeze the rope and take her to the grave. He picked her up and placed her into a space under the bed. Nelson knelt by the bed and said a prayer. He climbed on the bed, crushing her with his weight. He fell asleep. He napped as Lola Cowens perished. In the morning, he pulled her body out from under the bed and defiled it again. When he finished, he slid it back under the bed. Most of her bones were broken, and she bled from every orifice. Catherine Hill went upstairs to carry out some daily housekeeping duties when she noticed that Mr. Woodcott's door was open. She was surprised to find that both he and his suitcase were gone. He had already paid for days he had not spent there. It was odd. Lola Cowan's family searched in vain for their daughter. Naturally, the last thing they would have assumed would have been that the gorilla man was responsible. That was an American problem. Earl Nelson got an eyeful of Emily Patterson as she went about the business of cleaning her home. She wasn't old enough to be his grandmother, but there was a room to let sign in the window of her house, and that was the most important thing to him. He told her he had no money, but would do household repairs for a week's room and board. He fixed the hinge on a screen door, and she invited him in to talk about the possibility of renting the room to him. He came across as bashful and friendly, the charm of a little boy. When she turned her back to him, the little boy persona disappeared. He took the hammer he was holding and bludgeoned Emily on her head. She fell to the floor. She was neither dead nor unconscious, but she was immobilized. He pounded her head with the hammer several more times. He tied a rag around her throat and twisted it until the moment of her demise, thanking and blessing her all the while. Catherine Hill had a new tenant, and he was unhappy with the accommodations up on offer. He found the bed uncomfortable. There was an unpleasant odor in the room. Catherine went to the attic, assuming that the lodger was just a fusspot who was impossible to please. That assumption hit the skids when she entered the hall and got hit with a stench. It smelled like rotten meat. She wondered if a rat died up there. She opened the room's door. A storm of flies whizzed through the air. The stink was overwhelming now, so much so she nearly vomited. She intuited that it came from the bed. There was nothing on top of it or beside it that offered a clue to the origins of the smell. She crouched and took a look under the box spring. Catherine Hill's other tenants discovered her on the floor. She had fainted. When she came to, she told them what she had seen. They were incredulous at first, but then they saw the evidence for themselves. They contacted the police. Everybody in the house, including the police, had to make use of the bathroom after seeing what remained of Lola Cowan's.
Not only had the body taken on a discoloration, but with so many broken bones, the corpse was barely intact. Mr. Patterson returned home to find that his wife was nowhere to be found. He called the police, who searched the house for clues. A brown whipcord suit was missing. Seventy dollars the couple kept as a rainy day fund had disappeared. Earl Nelson's workman's clothes were stuffed under the bed alongside Emily's naked body. He left wearing one of her husband's suits. He left the murder weapon, a knife, behind with the workman's outfit. There was a trace of black rubber on the blade, which was found to have been matched to an electrical wire. The Canadian authorities now knew that the wave of a bloodbath had washed ashore from the United States. Nelson sold the suit at a second-hand store. He made the transaction an hour after killing Mrs. Patterson. The transaction, down to every last detail, was recorded in the store's records, a great help to police. Having taken care of this business, he went next door to a barber shop. The proprietor, Nick Tabor, noticed blood and scabs on Nelson's scalp. When he commented on this finding, Nelson growled at the man. He told him to mind his own business and to refrain from touching them. Tabor was an amateur phrenologist, that is, a person who studies the size and shape of a cranium to determine indicators of character and mental abilities. That was bad news for Earl Nelson, since Tabor was able to give the police a very thorough description of the man's head. The police were now in hot pursuit of the killer. The trail went cold when Nelson moved to Portage la Prairie. Portage la Prairie was a terminal city offering opportunities to go to places as varied as Brandon, Regina, Saskatoon, and Calgary. The police sent telegrams to and called every newspaper and police station in every town throughout Manitoba. His name, aliases, physical description, clothing, and stolen possessions were described. Eventually, this information was disseminated across the country. A reward of $1,500 approximately $23,021, was offered for information leading to the guerrilla killer's arrest. June 13th, Regina, Saskatchewan. Mary Rowe rented out a room in her home to one Mr. Harry Harcourt. He got up early while everyone else in the house was asleep. He went downstairs to read a newspaper. Harcourt stormed back upstairs in a rage. He tore his clothes off. The paper described what he had been wearing, and he had been wearing it that very day. He wore as little clothing as possible. It was June, so he couldn't hide his outfit underneath a parka. He packed up his possessions and headed downtown. He went to a department store and bought blue overalls, a shirt, and a cap more workman's clothes. He went to a second-hand store to sell the rest of his clothing. None of them were described in the papers, so he assumed the clerk would not know he was the famous murderer from the States. He assumed incorrectly. In the 1920s, clothing was not made in Asian sweatshops. This clothing's labels were affixed in Winnipeg. After Nelson left, the clerk reported him to the police. Nelson left Regina immediately. Earl Nelson made a deal with a man named Isidore Silverman. Silverman was a scrap metal merchant who drove to myriad locations in the countryside, picking up what discarded metal he could find in farms and residential properties. The deal was that Earl would pay him to drive him out of town. He accepted the condition that he wait while Silverman picked up scrap metal. This was just fine with Earl Nelson. The more time spent outside of Regina, the better. Nelson was wrong to think that the police would not search for him in rural communities. Even if the local municipal police force was ill-equipped, there were always the Mounties, 
Police were driving up and down the roads as Isidore Silverman made his rounds. After his journey with Silverman, he arrived at Boisavant, Manitoba. It was a small town, but it was crawling with cops. He didn't stay there for long. As soon as he got out of Silverman's truck, he began hitchhiking. Serial killers were not a commonality in Boisavant, so the locals pitied the man who was down on his luck, thumbing a ride. A farmer picked him up. He hitchhiked from one rural county to another. He wound up in the town of Wacopa. He went to Morgan's General Store to purchase some food. Leslie Morgan was the store's proprietor, a man who read the newspapers every damn day. The gorilla killer had been staring back at him for days. It took him no time at all to recognize him as the man sitting outside his shop, eating. As soon as Nelson was out the door, Morgan called the police. Constable W.A. Gray of the Manitoba Provincial Police was dispatched to make the arrest. The problem was, he was located too far away to get to Morgan's general store on time. Nelson left before he got there. After talking with Leslie Morgan, he sought Nelson on foot cross-country. He was trained in how to track a suspect through a forest. He followed mud footprints, broken branches, and rabbit trails. Constable Gray finally found him. He drew his service revolver and ordered Nelson to stop in his tracks. Nelson held up his hands. He acted more confused than culpable. He claimed to be a man named Virgil Wilson, a day laborer and farmhand seeking work. Gray wanted confirmation of his identity. They both walked back to Wacopa, where Gray cuffed Nelson and put him in the back seat of his car. He drove him to the jail in Killarney, Manitoba. Gray sent a telegram to Detective George Smith in Winnipeg. He told him he captured a suspect in the guerrilla killings and requested confirmation of the man's identity. The physical description was a match, but the clothing details had changed markedly. Gray went back to the jail to find that it was eerily silent, as if it were unoccupied. Of course it was. The cell's door was ajar. There was a metal nail file lodged inside of it. Nelson escaped. Gray went back to the general store to send a telegram to all police departments in the surrounding area so they would know he was on the loose once again. Earl Nelson hid in some long grain by some railroad tracks near Killarney. The next train was due stateside. He jumped aboard from a grain tower. It was a passenger train and he couldn't have possibly made a worse choice for a cabin. He assumed it was a luggage car. He was mistaken. An extra car was added before it departed from Winnipeg. It was boarded by police officers at full capacity, ready for the manhunt for Earl Nelson. They couldn't believe their good luck. They all drew their guns at him. He held up his hands and surrendered. In Winnipeg, there was a veritable parade of onlookers at the train station, estimated at 3,000, eager to have a look at the infamous Dark Strangler. While in custody, witnesses came in to identify Nelson in lineups. They all confirmed that it was he they encountered. He tried to lie his way out of it, but to no avail. The captain of the San Francisco Police Department flew up to Canada with a copy of Earl Nelson's fingerprints. They were a match. Earl Nelson was indicted for the murder of Mrs. Emily Patterson. He wasn't charged for the rest of the Canadian crimes. They felt that only one trial and hanging would be sufficient. American detectives visited his cell and pleaded with him to confess to the crimes he committed stateside, so they could close the cases and the families could get some closure of their own. He refused. He admitted that he was Earl Nelson, 
but refused to concede that he was even so much as capable of committing such offenses. To quote Nelson, For a godly man like me, a crime such as murder is simply impossible. He took the old tack of reciting scripture to convince people of his innocence, but they were immune to his attempts at manipulation. It became clear that he was not going to cooperate with the police, so they gave the media full access to Nelson. To them, he not only confessed, but divulged graphic and gruesome details they were unable to print. The police gathered together all the information he gave to the reporters and constructed it as a confession. Nelson refused to sign it, then recanted. He repeated that he did nothing wrong, and nobody could prove otherwise. During the trial of Earl Nelson, there was little his lawyer could do to achieve clemency. The character witnesses did not convince the jury that he was troubled by mental illness, but not evil. If he had heard Jesus Christ himself telling him to kill, it would not have convinced them that he was inculpable. After less than a half hour, the jury adjudged him guilty. November 5th, Earl Nelson was sentenced to death by hanging. Corrections officers would hear Nelson recite this quote from the book of Proverbs. My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. For a whore is a deep ditch, and a strange woman is a narrow pit. She also lieth in wait as for a prey, and increase the transgressors among men. He spent his last few hours as a mortal reciting the book of Revelations from memory. January 13th, 1928 the day of his hanging. Earl Nelson was allowed to make one final statement before his execution. He said, I am innocent. I stand innocent before God and man. I forgive those who have wronged me and ask forgiveness of those I have injured. God have mercy. Karma in its purest form. The human monster who strangled so many women to death choked out his final breath after he was dropped from the hanging platform. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now.